You're listening to the Sunday podcast from Life Point Church in Santan Valley, Arizona. We hope you are encouraged by today's message. For more information, visit us online at lifepointaz.com. Um, grab a Bible and open it up to uh, Mark chapter 2, if you will. Today begins not only a new year, but a new series, and a series in fasting and prayer, the importance of fasting and prayer. And in the past four years, we have done a series called Fast, Pray, and then the third word was always sort of the focus for the year, like fast, pray, go. Go into the nations, go into your neighborhood, fast, pray, ask, ask, and you shall receive, stuff like that. And as we, uh, usually in October, November, the pastors would get together, we pray, we'd ask God for wisdom for the coming year, and then set that up. And as we did that this year, uh, the truth is we said, I don't think we're supposed to do that again. And over the course of a few weeks, God began to reveal to us something really cool and also humbling that he said, you have it backwards. It's not fast, pray, serve, or give, or go, but it's repent or submit, pray, and fast. You see, if you don't do those first two, then the fasting doesn't have the power, it doesn't have the result, the purpose of the fast. If you aren't submitted to the Lord, if you haven't entered into it prayerfully, then what's the purpose of fasting? And so as we enter into this, uh, this month and next month, this also isn't just going to be a three-week series. We're going to go into February because I have said for the last few months, and you've heard other speakers up here say that God has big things for Santan Valley, that God intends to use life point. Well, guess what? Your life point, right? I'm not life point. You make up life point. And so when God says he's got big things for this community and he's using life point, that means he's going to use you, which means... We have to get ready. You ever seen a Rocky movie? We're gonna have a five minute montage moment where we're all working hard, studying the Bible, sweating out, not eating, right? It's gonna get real up in here because we have to be prepared for the fight that's coming. You understand, amen? There is a fight coming. And if it's not already here, uh, then it's coming and we have to be prepared for it. And the way to do that is to repent, pray, and fast before our God. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that this morning. If you're open to Mark 2, chapter, chapter 2, verses 30, 13 through 27, and it reads like this. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake, and a large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. So Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus turned and said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call the sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees, they were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples fast, but yours do not? Jesus says, how can the guest of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so as long as they have him with them, he's speaking of himself, but the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day, my disciples will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the new cloth will tear and pull away, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins because of the fermentation of the new wine, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. So one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, have you never read what David did when his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he then gave some to his companions. And so this he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is even Lord of the Sabbath. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? God... Help us to see what you're showing us here this morning. Open our eyes and ears, God, how easy it is to become blinded to the truth. Allow us to see and hear you. 
In Jesus' name, amen. You know the game of baseball? It can be a confusing game. Have you ever thought about the rules of baseball? I mean, have you ever really thought about the rules? For some of you think, well, the game's boring and confusing as it is. No, I don't care about the rules. But let's look at some of the rules of baseball. If you don't hit the ball, you're out. That is, unless you get four bad pitches before you get three good ones. You need to run really fast if you hit the ball, but you don't need to run if you hit the ball on the wrong side of the white line. You also don't need to run really fast if they catch the ball because then you're out, but they have to catch it before it bounces once on the ground. You can run past first base and you can run past home plate, but you're not allowed to run past second or third. You have to stop on those bases or you're out. If you've got the ball, you need to step on the base to get someone out. That is, unless you need to actually tag the person to get them out. What? Anybody else? Like, I'm sorry. What? And yet, this is America's national pastime. This is, how many people here have kids or grandkids that play t-ball or some form of baseball or softball? Right? We all do. Why? Why in the world would kids play a game with so many rules, with so many confusing rules? Because it's not about the rules. They love the game. They love the camaraderie. They love the competition, the companionship, the teamwork. That's what they love, right? And your kids begin to love it. Even little girls and little boys who don't watch baseball, don't care for baseball, go out and play the sport. They love it. They beg their parents to take them back week after week because they love the sport and what the sport offers them. They don't even know all the rules. I know this. I've been working with Paladin for a while. They do not know all the rules. Not even the adult league, unfortunately. But they do it because they love the sport. You know, oftentimes right now in our culture, the Bible is viewed that same way, isn't it? If you were to begin to list the rules of the Bible, they are confusing. They are outdated, so to speak. There are hundreds of them. I think some of them contradict other ones, we say. How in the world am I supposed to follow God? This is so confusing. I have to do my devotions. I have to give my time. But then I'm supposed to be Mary, not Martha, and just sit at the Lord's feet. And then I'm listening for him. And then he doesn't talk to me. And then my mind, I get distracted. And I start to think about anybody else following along with this line of thought. The fact is, if a walk with the Lord is based on the rules, it's always going to be frustrating and confusing. In fact, anything in your life is going to be frustrating and confusing if all you are concerned about are the rules. And yet, the crazy thing about rules is this, without them, the game's not fun, huh? You ever had that kid or adult who changes the rules in the middle of the game? I see it a lot with our kids and tag, right? They get tagged and then they get tagged back and then obviously there's no tag backs. Did you establish that at the beginning of the name? No, I just now did because it benefits me to not have tag backs. Or you're playing pick up football or pick up baseball and somehow the rules change. That's no longer the line, the line's over here. We don't like those people, do we? Nobody likes the person who decides to change the rules of the game in the middle of the game to benefit themselves. And yet, you see where I'm going with this already, that's exactly what we've done with God's word. We have taken his word which is what the Pharisees did. They took the law, which had over 700 laws in it, right? There's a lot of laws in the Torah and in God's law, the old covenant. Listen to this, over 700. And by the time Jesus came, they had added 1,521 more. 1,000. You know what God gave Moses? 10. You know what? God gave Adam and Eve? One. (laughs) Do you see what sin is doing? Is it making life easier or harder? God gave Adam and Eve one. He gave Moses 10. He then gave the priests the 700 plus and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of Judaism at the time, added another 1,521. And we now live in a country. Anybody know how many laws we have in our country? It's like our national debt counter. Have you ever seen that? Where it's just always moving? That's sort of our laws right now. 
There's just constantly more laws. There's thousands upon thousands of laws in this country. So many laws that half of them don't even get followed in certain states. Certain ones like you can't ride your horse on Sunday, stuff like that, really funny old laws that have never been abolished. We just don't follow them anymore. But that's what sin does. Sin takes the truth of God's word and it says, you know, there's things in here I don't like and so I'm gonna change the rules. I wanna read something for you this morning. One of our elders gave all the pastors this book. It's uh, Morning and Evening Devotionals by Charles Spurgeon. It's fantastic. I've been reading it for the last few weeks. And this was this morning's, and I thought, wow, this couldn't have been more timely. This is uh, Charles Spurgeon speaking, and he says this. Sons of light must not have fellowship with deeds, doctrines, or deceits of darkness. The children of the day must be sober, honest, and bold in their Lord's work, leaving the works of darkness to those who will dwell there forever. Our churches should by discipline divide the light from the darkness, and we should by our distinct separation from the world do the same. Now, I want to read that to you because where I'm going today has a tendency to go into your ears as, okay, I'm off the hook, and out the other side as apathy, boredom. Oh, I don't have to do anything. And so I'm laying the foundation here that the church, I love what Spurgeon says, the church's distinct responsibility is to separate truth from non-truth, light from the darkness, which means there is a truth out there. It is unquestionable, it is undeniable, it is not something that is relative, it is solid, it is foundational. In fact, you know it is, and we know that we know it is. We know that unbelievers in this room and around the world know it is because we have been changing the rules based on that truth for centuries, right? Think about it, it's the game, like baseball, and they're just changing and adding the rules, but the fact is the game is still the same game. The game is called the moral law, morality. Basic reason, logic, and understanding. That's the game that God gave us. He gave it to Adam and Eve, and he's given it to every human sense. And the fact of the matter is, we haven't changed the game. We've just tried to change the rules to make it more appealing to whatever the current leaders want. So if you don't understand the difference between light and darkness or truth and non-truth, then you will be tossed around by every current prevailing thought of whatever generation you're living in. And you can see that throughout history. This isn't a Christian thing. This is just a look at a book thing. (laughs) Look at any history book. When you say there is no truth and everything is relative and yet you're still trying to play by God's rules, you're missing the point of the game. You're missing the point of life. That's what the Pharisees were doing when Christ came. 1,521 additional rules to follow about fasting, about prayer, about what to wear, about what to eat, about how you give, about how you serve, about how you do your work, how you raise a family, how you're a spouse, every single part of your life. And the purpose was, and we still have this thought today in our country, that if we can put more rules around people then they'll stop sinning. They'll stop doing bad things because it's now a law, right? It is currently a law in Arizona to not look at your phone and drive. How many of you sinned in that law this week? Don't raise your hand. I will have to report. I've got to report you now. (laughs) Christy, too. Did she start to raise her hand? Yeah. Right? Has it stopped anybody? No, we'll still do it. You're in your car, no one's looking. You still pick it up, take a look at it, but it's now a law. You see, God never intended that. God knows that it's not about the law, it's not about the rules, it's about whether or not you love the game, or whether or not you love his son, Jesus Christ. See, if you became a Christian just to help sort of ensure your destiny, your eternal salvation, your spirit in the afterlife, You're missing the point of Christ. 
and you come to it and you're like, man, this is just rules and religion and I can't keep up and so I can't be good enough for him and I always feel bad about myself and I have low self-esteem because of this religion. No, you have low self-esteem because you don't know Jesus. You don't know him. You know of him. You don't know him. That's where the low self-esteem comes from. You see, when you know the game, when you know who God is and what he's built you for, the rules are secondary. They're secondary because the relationship, the passion, the joy of the game becomes first in your life. Are you hearing me? You gotta hear me on this because when I say something like the rules are secondary, I know all of my Calvinist and Reformed people are like, "Mm mm-mm. That's why I read this first. The church is the dividing line between the truth and the non-truth. But hear me on this. If I take a kid who hates baseball and I put him in there and I make him play and make him do all the rules, does he now, because he knows the rules, begin to like the sport? No. If he hates it, he hates it. But if he loves the game, will he learn the rules? And he'll learn that when he follows the rules, that actually makes the game, what? More enjoyable. It's actually fun. The rules are actually there to help him have fun, to even the playing field, to to bring about lively competition. The rules are actually there for his benefit. But if he doesn't love the game, then that doesn't matter. You catching what I'm putting down here? If... If our friends, if our neighbors, if our family members, if you do not love, love the person of Jesus, then the rest of this must just be a tremendous burden to you. The weight of religion is massive. It's crushing without the relationship with Christ. You hear me? I'm going to say that again because I just thought of that and I didn't say it in first service. The weight of religion will crush you without the relationship with Jesus Christ. It was crushing to the Pharisees. God alone said it, uh, Jesus said it himself to his disciple when he said, aren't we supposed to make the Gentiles do circumcision? And he's like, no. What is it, Paul? Paul said it. We, can be, we couldn't even follow those laws. Why would we then make the Gentiles follow them as well? It was crushing. And that was the point. That was the point of the law. The point of the law was to show the world through God's people, Israel, that his standard is more than we can attain. So he sent his son. He sent his son to attain it. And he said, all you have to do is get to know the son. Know the son, and the rules will make sense. Know the son, and life will make sense. Know the son, and depression and anxiety and low self-esteem will be put in their right place. Know the sun. Pharisees were upset because Jesus' disciples weren't fasting. They were upset not because they cared about people, but because they cared more about the rules. So here's a litmus test for us today. If we're, you're beginning to have a little bit of a Pharisaic, Pharisaic spirit, Pharisaical, did I get it, Pharisaic? Here's the first one. You're more concerned about people following the rules than you are about people. This is, a, this is your own sort of self-examination. When I look at Facebook, when I look at my friends, when I look at my children, when I look at my spouse, when I look at people in my sphere of influence, am I more concerned that they're following rules or that they have a relationship with Christ, that they know him? And if they don't have a relationship with Christ, and I know they don't have a relationship with Christ, what in my life is exhibiting that relationship to them, that it's something worth having? Right? I remember when I grew up, I didn't like baseball. I was a fan of basketball, and I liked football growing up. And then in my uh, early 20s, I met a guy who was a massive baseball fan, and he taught me the ins and outs of what an ace pitcher is versus a number five pitcher and the matchups and how intriguing the game can be beyond just the you know batting and catching and getting people out. And as he began to show me his passion for the game, 
and begin to teach me about the game, it actually inspired in me a passion for the game. What in your life is inspiring people around you to know more about who this Jesus Christ is? Right? Is it your Facebook posts? Do you just do Facebook posts which make non-Christians feel shameful and guilty? Thus saith the Lord, don't have sex, ever. <laughs> it says so in the Bible, never have it, it's wrong. Thus saith the Lord, rock and roll is evil, and you're evil if you listen to it. Think about it, think about it. The posts I am doing, do the posts I am doing draw people nearer to the heart of Christ or further away? Do the words that I speak bring my children nearer to Christ or does it drive them away? The second one is this. The Pharisees despised anyone who didn't do religion like they did. They despised you if you did not do religion exactly the way that they said so in their 1,500 laws to do it. Mark chapter three, just a chapter over, one and two tells us, another time he went, Jesus, into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal the man on the Sabbath. Can we just take a moment? This guy is going to take a broken, shriveled hand and make it whole, and you're more worried that he's going to break one of your made-up rules. What? Like, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. Like, how are you not just in awe of what he just did? They could care less about the person with the crippled hand. They could care less about the blind man on the side of the street. All they care about is their religion, and the weight of religion is crushing. Mark 3, 6 says the Pharisees went out, and after seeing Christ heal the man, began to plot with the Herodians that they might kill Jesus. Ah, he did it. He did something we've never seen before or never seen another man do. Let's kill him. Why? Because he doesn't do religion the way we tell him to do religion. Do I sound like modern day Christians? We won't actually kill you. We'll just kill you with words and we'll shun you and we'll push you out of our social circle. That's sort of how we do it nowadays if you're doing stuff we don't like. I know it's the first of the year. This is a little thought provoking. <sighs> sorry, not sorry. So here's, here's how Jesus responds to this attitude, and this is what I'm going to close with. Yep, got to close here. Um, you're going to have a little bit of homework this week because this is going to be a different fasting season, and so my goal is not, if you're fasting now, great. If you're not, uh, I want you to be praying this week. And, and what, what I want you to do is really simple, but it's not easy. It's very simple, but it's not easy. For the next seven days... And you, you'll have to put a reminder in your phone or your day timer or your Rolodex, whatever you use, I don't know. And remind yourself in the morning when you wake up, I want you to ask God this question. You ready? Nobody's writing it down, so no one's actually going to do it. I'll give you a moment to write it down. I've got a game this afternoon. <laughs> Men's softball. It's the highest level of sports. <laughs> if it was easy, they'd call it baseball. All right, Mark 2.19. This is what Jesus says of a pharisaical attitude. I'm still waiting for you to get your phones out so you can write it down, so I'm going to read you this. How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have them, him with them. When we fast... It is not about the sacrifice of what we are giving up. And this is something that I must come to you and say I've been wrong in. In the Fast Pray Go, Fast Pray Ask series, we've said, if you want to fast from social media, from TV, from movies, from a hobby, from your phone, go ahead. That's part of the fast. No, it wasn't. And I'm wrong and guilty and I repent before you. It's not. That's actually consecrating yourself, which is good. It's good to consecrate yourself for a period of time from things that are taking your attention away from God. But a fast has to deal with something called food. Food. It is a necessity to our bodies. 
In America, it has become more than a necessity. It is a God, right? I'm the worst of the sinners, as Paul said. It is literally a God. It is an idol. It is worshipped. It is loved. The idea of a fast causes most of us to go, no, thank you. Only the super Christians do those, not me. You know the super Christians, right? The ones who won't even eat a pizza unless it's been delivered. I stole that joke from Michael Jr., so just for the internet. Um, but it's not. What, you want, what I, what I want to show you here over these next few weeks is that in order to accomplish the things that God is calling life point to, in order to break a spirit of suicide, which is on Santan Valley, in order to break a spirit of depression, a spirit of worthlessness, of being thrown out, of being cast away that is on this valley, God says you're going to have to repent and submit. You're going to pray, and my people are going to fast. And we're, we're talking fasting from food. And I realize there's health concerns. I realize there's medicines you're on. Uh, I realize all of that. And so what it means is that you have to figure it out. You know what? I'm in the same boat. I'm in the same boat. I have to figure it out. I can't just go do a straight water fest. So I've got to figure something out. But the point of it is this. When we fast from food, a vital nutrient our body needs, it forces you to rely and look to the Lord. It reminds you of your immortality. It reminds you of your weakness. It reminds you that you need him. And I'll be honest, as Americans, we forget that an awful lot because there's not much we need him for. We've got all of our basic necessities met. And so if we're going to do this, if we're going to do this, then we need to first come before the Lord. And this is the question I want you to write down. Lord God, what do I have in my life that's not submitted to you? Just ask. Some of you already know the answer to that question, right? Who knows the answer to that question? I'm kidding. Don't raise your hand. It's okay. But some of you already know you have something in your life that is not submitted to the Lord. Is it food? Greed? Lust? We can go on and on. Then there's good things in your life too. Your children, your marriage. Lord, what, what have I not submitted to you? That's the question. For seven days, I want you to wake up and ask the Lord that question until he clearly gives you an answer. And then here's the deal. I'm telling you, you're going to want to write this down. I want you to write down what he shows you and bring it into church next Sunday because we're going to be doing something here on stage with those. It's not embarrassing. It won't be read aloud or put on the projector. Just trust me, you'll want to be a part of it. Lord, what in my life needs to be submitted to you? That is the question for seven days. Because next week, starting next Sunday, there's going to be some things, some challenges. Challenges get more difficult, let me put it that way. It's like algebra, right? The first week you go in and you go, oh, I can do this. And then you realize, no, you can't. <laughs> get halfway through the semester, you haven't looked at anything, and there's more letters than there are numbers, and you're just scared. Whoa, that was like a flashback to high school. Lord God, what do I have that's not submitted to you? Let's pray. Father, you are calling us into big things, and I'm excited. I'm excited to see these generational ties broken. I'm excited to see young people, Lord, who thought suicide was the only way be shown a better way. I'm excited, God, that you're preparing the workers for the harvest. I'm excited that you've chosen to use LifePoint, that you've made it so clear, Lord, that you're restoring the hearts of men and women in this congregation. But Lord, just like anything worth doing and doing well, we have to be prepared. And so I pray over the next coming weeks you would prepare the hearts of the men and women here, even those who are not here this morning, God. that we would seek you first, that we would submit the things in our lives we have held back so that we can move forward in this time of prayer and fasting. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'm going to call the ushers forward. We're going to take communion, partake in communion, I should say, as we come to the Lord's table. And communion is sort of some, you know, amongst a congregant in a church, maybe it's lost its specialness. Maybe it's just something we do at the end of every service. I hope it doesn't become that. Honestly, I hope if you feel that there are areas of your life that are not submitted to God that you would abstain from taking it. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, we definitely ask you to abstain from partaking. Because when you partake of communion, you're saying, I agree and I receive unto myself the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what you're saying. So if you don't believe that, don't take it. If you don't believe that and you want to believe that or you want to talk to somebody, we got our prayer partners up front. We invite you to come forward, pray for any reason. But in just a moment here after I pray, we have three stations up front, three in the back. We invite you to go take the two cups, go back to your seat, partake of communion, spend some time with the Lord, and then we'll close in worship, okay? Let's pray. God, we bless the communion now. Your body and your blood, as you told your disciples, shed for the forgiveness of sins. God Almighty submitted to the form of a human man, then submitted his own wants and desires to be punished for sins he did not commit so that I might be set free. Thank you, God. Thank you so much for the gift of the cross and of the tomb and of your resurrection. Bless this communion now as we receive it in Jesus' name.